welcome. Very good to see all of you. Grateful that you've come as we've gathered to worship the Lord this evening. We'll return to Matthew's Gospel tonight. Look forward to spending more time together in the Word. So come, friends. Let's worship the Lord. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth. Let's pray together. Father, you are the almighty and eternal God. Your glory is revealed in the person of your Son, our Savior and Lord. And that power, that glory, that is something we have known as we have walked with you over the years as you have, as you have revealed yourself to us. And we thank you so much for the true and living God whom we know through Jesus Christ. So it's in the name of your Son that we would once again worship and serve you this evening and be sent out to worship and serve you this week. We claim the sacrifice of your Son as we stand before you as redeemed people, justified and sanctified by faith in your Son. We rejoice in the resurrection of your Son and the hope we have to enter a new and holy life and our own hope of resurrection, new bodies, and the life to come. To help us to walk in the ways of that Son all our days, to delight in Him until He comes again. And may all glory then be to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And for our first hymn tonight, let's sing hymn 701. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, hymn 701. Stand with me, please. <laughs> Take a moment to pray for a few of the folks on our prayer list. Ask for God to meet their needs and give them grace. So pray with me, please. Father in heaven, again, we do thank you that you are the good shepherd. And as we mentioned, folks, again to you tonight that are on our prayer list, we pray you would draw near to them and that you would make known to them your love. And thank you for the way you do care for your people. And there are folks on this list we've prayed for over the years, folks that we've taken off the list because you answered prayer. And we thank you for that. Other times, folks that have walked through deep valleys where you've called to be with you. You're the good shepherd. You hold their lives and our lives in your hand. And so that's why we would bring them to you, even by name tonight, and ask for you to care for them, to make known to them your love, to give them grace for whatever need they may have, whether it's to know your presence, to know your love, to experience physical healing, to know patience, or the relief of a burden, Lord, meet that need. So we would bring before you tonight Mary Peterson. We do thank you that her children are living with her. She's not alone. She's cared for, so make known to her your love and however many years you continue to give her. Pray for those on our cancer list, like Mike Wilson, 
Patricia Brooks Gaylord, for Marty Richards, for Alicia Terhar, for Peter Bennett and Cindy Bishop, for Scotty Lowe, for Jesse Barnado, for Elise Turner, for Ann Burton, for my stepmom Cheryl, that they would know your grace, your healing grace, that they would know each day that you have your lives in their hands, in your hands, that uh, you are caring for them. And you will meet every need. So be pleased to spare them uh, from sickness or trial. And make known to them your care. We pray for those involved in military service. Some part-time and some all the way. I think of Jonathan Williams, a pastor at Fairview. But also serving as an Air Force chaplain. I think of Stacy Smith and Todd Crawford. Just pray that you would be with them. That they would know your grace. That they would serve justly and honorably. And that they would do good to others. And you'd keep them safe. And for a few others that are on our list, we think of Rosalinda Price and Rod Hendricks. Think of Tosh Gross, still with long COVID symptoms that, that continue to impact his daily life. Think of Jeff Wynn, uh, with the new life that he and his family have now uh, because of this stroke. Pray for Bart Casey and Ronnie Hughes, for Mike and Debbie Satterfield, and Donna Taylor and, and Dr. Taylor as he cares for her. For Kay Arthur as she cares for family members. And for Joan as she continues to deal with uh, the difficulties of this condition, show her mercy and, and relief and provide answers there. Keep her and Don safe as they travel in the next few weeks. But above all, Lord, we just we thank you that you're the good shepherd and that you care for us. We pray that you would show mercy in all these situations. We commit them to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let's sing him now. I, I mix that up. Let's now sing uh, hymn 539, Jerusalem the Golden. I've seen this in the hymn book for a long time and always wanted to sing it. So the ladies are going to play through it one time. It will be new to us. And then we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of hymn 539. evening to Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. You'll notice that hymn, the author is Bernard of Cluny from the 12th century. Just the thought of singing a song in continuity with the church going back that far uh, is a good thing for us as the people of God. So Matthew chapter 21 is our consideration this evening. It's been a few weeks since we were in Matthew's Gospel, but we will pick up right where we left off. Matthew 21, beginning tonight at verse 
23. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. We'll look at the rest of the chapter tonight for the opening reading. Let me read verses 23 through 27. And let's hear God's word. Jesus entered the temple courts. And while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven... He will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Amen. That's the ending of God's word, and let's pray for his help. Father in heaven, we thank you for this reading tonight from Holy Scripture and the verses that we will read as we work through this passage. We love your word. It is truth. It, it is powerful. It has the ability to speak to us, to change us, to transform us. It, it does that at times when we read it alone. It does it when we sit and hear it read in, in the assembly and when it is preached and proclaimed to us. So bless tonight your word. And thank you for Jesus Christ, the living word, the word who was with God and was God and has made God known to us tonight. So through this written word, may we see and worship the living word, and may we rejoice in him and go out as his witnesses. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In our previous time together, we looked at the beginning of Matthew chapter 22, and we noticed there Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, and that he began to perform several symbolic and confrontational actions. So the triumphal entry is symbolic. You see him doing something. He doesn't speak any words in the recorded uh, of Matthew's gospel as he enters. But he's saying something by what he's doing. And what he's saying is somewhat confrontational. He's declaring his kingship to Jerusalem and to the religious leaders. And then he comes and he cleanses the temple. He speaks at that event, but he also does actions. And his actions speak as loudly as his words. He declares judgment on the temple. And then he goes out of Jerusalem and he curses the fig tree. Again, a declaration of judgment and a declaration of authority. He tells the disciples, you can pray, move this mountain, probably referring to the Jerusalem mountain, the religious establishment, and God will do it. Jesus is the one through whom God is now acting. And as the disciples leave that message, respond well to that message, so they will experience Jesus' blessing. Well, now we come to the other half of the chapter, the events that follow what we consider last time. And many of tonight's passages, if not the whole thing, will focus on the religious leader's response to Jesus. What do they say in the light of these things? How do they question him based on these actions? Verse 23 that we read identifies the religious leaders as listening to Jesus. Later in the chapter, verse 45 identifies them as the target of his words. He's speaking to them, and they are responding to him. And much of their response regards who does this man think he is? Who does this northern villager think he is to make these challenges to the official authorities? And Jesus, in response to that question, he responds to their challenges with his own sayings and his own parables in tonight's passage, which asks the question, who are the people of God? And it's interesting overlap with what we consider this morning in Romans. How is God bringing his story to a conclusion? And who are those that are going to participate? Really, the same questions are being asked in Matthew's gospel which is really a clue of how Matthew and Paul and the early church thought about Jesus and his relationship to the Old Testament. So, uh, a sayings, an interaction of Jesus with the religious leaders, and then two parables tonight, which all revolve around the question, 
who are the people of God? They challenge Jesus, and in response, he asks them this question. Well, let's look at the three episodes that develop that question. First, in verses 23 to 27, you have John's authority and Jesus. We see here in verse 23 that Jesus enters the temple court, and that is where he begins to teach. If you read the rest of Matthew, you'll find Jesus spends most of his final week teaching in the temple. Again, it's Passover season. The crowds would come to the temple. It was, it was expected to find rabbis there teaching. That's exactly what Jesus does during this final week. And as we've already said, we see the religious leaders coming to him, the chief priests and the elders of the people. They're directly identified by Matthew as part of Jesus' audience. You see, what he did when he came in has not been lost on them. He poses a threat. As one scholar writes, he's a threat to their official status as guardians of the temple and of the community affairs of Jerusalem. And again, what we said this morning, these different groups that view themselves as protecting Israel, as securing God's blessing, they may have had different answers. Pharisees and Sadducees normally didn't get along, didn't have the same answers, didn't look at the solution the same way, but they did look at the problem the same way. If we get out of line with God, we risk his judgment. And Jesus here is a threat to us. So he's going to bring those parties together because he represents a common threat. They view him as heretical. His teaching puts us in danger. His teaching puts us uh, a danger to the government. So whether it's the Pharisees maybe looking at it as God's wrath or the Sadducees as, as upsetting the apple cart too much, Jesus is a threat. And so when Jesus comes in and declares his temple over them and starts doing things that are threatening to them, they need to come and interact with this person and find out what is going on. So they put to him the question of verse 23, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the authority to come in here and do these actions and say these things? Now it's interesting, Jesus gets a lot of questions in the Gospels, but he doesn't always answer them. And often he likes to respond with a question. That's exactly what he does in verses 24 and 25. He answers their question with a question. And his question compares him with John the Baptist. He says, John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? Jesus is trying to establish some continuity between himself and John the Baptist in order to lead these teachers to a certain conclusion. You see, John, like Jesus, he challenged the religious establishment. He called them to repent. John asked the question, who is the true Israel? Remember, hey, don't say we've got, we're the children of Abraham. God can use these stones to produce children of Abraham. So John shows up and says, it's not about ethnicity. It's not about tradition. It's not about your good works. God's saving reign is here. But you have to forsake your trust in those things. You've got to forsake your way of securing God's blessing. And you need to be the people of God. As God laid it out in the Old Testament, and as these latter-day prophets are declaring to you, you must repent and do these things that God has told you to do in order to secure his blessing. And if you've read Matthew's Gospel, there's little doubt about who Jesus thinks John is. He said back in chapter 11, verse 9, he's a prophet and more than a prophet. So Jesus approves of John's message. He approves of his authority. And so he wants to put these religious leaders on the horns of a dilemma. And their dilemma is made very clear to us by, God, by Matthew in this gospel account. If we admit, yes, John had heavenly authority, then Jesus will ask us, why did you reject him? And the point there isn't just to say, hey, you should have listened to John. The point would be to say, if John had heavenly authority, how much more does Jesus? Jesus has come preaching the same message, announcing the same reign, giving the same calls to repent, and doing miraculous signs to authenticate his authority. So if you had believed John, then how much more should you have believed me? 
And that's what they don't want to admit, because then they will really find themselves in a difficult spot. However, if they were to admit, oh, John, he, was a, he didn't have heavenly authority. He didn't have human authority. That's, that's a way of saying he's a false prophet. He doesn't have any authority. Well, now they risk losing standing with the people. And I know sometimes when we read the gospel accounts, the way they're presented, we might, we might look at these guys and say, oh yeah, they're the bad guys, you know, nobody liked them. They had a lot of respect with the people. Even Pharisees were held in very high regard as holy people. They would not want to risk losing that influence, losing that standing. And so they refuse to answer. And since they refuse to answer, Jesus refuses to answer. But don't think for a minute that this is the end of the discussion. Oh no. Now Jesus will give a parable that comments on this situation and the severity of Israel not listening to John or Jesus. So let's go into the next section then, which is the first of a few parables that we find. Let's read verses 28 through 32. Jesus says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Now, right before we jump into the details of this parable, this parable is the first of three parables. So we have two in the rest of this chapter, and then the next chapter opens with the third. And again, as one commentator puts it, they focus on the failure of the current Jerusalem leadership to respond to God's call. And they go on to explore the consequences of their failure for the future of the people of God. He continues, in all three parables, two groups of people are contrasted. Those who assume that they have a right to their privileged position and those who instead find themselves unexpectedly promoted. And as we will see in this particular parable, the people most despised by those presently in power are the ones who are going to be promoted. There's this great reversal that we've often seen in Matthew's Gospel. One last comment. All three parables thus speak of a radical and unexpected reversal of roles, and so raise far-reaching and troubling reflections about how the Israel of Jesus' day relates to the people of God in the future. So you see why we're framing tonight's lesson the way we are. Who are the true people of God and how do you know them? That's what these parables will tell us. So let's look at this particular parable. What, what's beautiful about these is, is they're pretty easy to understand. Now, they're not obscure or difficult like some other parables we find in the Gospels. There's the man. He has two sons. And he needs them to go work in the vineyard. So probably a small family farm growing grapes as we read here from the reference to the vineyard. Something that the people in Israel would have been familiar with. There would have been these located around uh, the area where they uh, lived. But not only was it a familiar agricultural picture as if we refer to a hay field or, or a beef farm. Uh, it's also a biblical symbol for Israel. In Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah compares Israel to his vineyard, where God expected to find fruit. That will come out even stronger in the next parable. So it's language they knew from everyday life. It's language they knew from their scriptures. And as I've already said, the main idea is easy to understand. One son says, no, I won't go, but then does. He has the wrong words, the right actions. The second son has the right words, but does not have the essential actions. And so Jesus says, which one does the will of God? And, and even the audience answers in a way that affirms Jesus' point. The one who does the will of the Father. 
To which these, Jesus then uses that to say, all right, that's not the situation you're in. You're not doing the will of the Father. And again, think about what we've seen throughout Matthew over these many months. That phrase, doing the will of the Father, that came up at the end of Matthew 7. Remember the Sermon on the Mount? Those who say, Lord, Lord, we've done these great miracles, we've thrown out the demons, and Jesus says, I don't know you. You, you haven't done the will of my Father. <laughs> Those who truly belong to God are identified by obedience to his will. Not mere profession, but obedience to his will. And, and that can work seamlessly with what we saw this morning, that it's a simple confession. That it is faith that brings justification. But that faith is intertwined with a confession, Jesus is Lord. There's a surrender to him. It's a very basic, very simple, very gracious, and yet brings with it this whole orientation and attitude of doing the will of God. And I would even say, I think it's important to say this as, as we continually you know, return to the word of God, to be, to be reformed people who are subject to, to the word of God, that we would do the will of God as God defines it. And we wouldn't lose sight of what scripture says, and we wouldn't begin to devise, oh, this is God's will, this is what God wants me and my church to do. But we would always bring it under the authority of God's holy word. That's why Matthew organizes his gospel in such a way that the Sermon on the Mount at the beginning is such a concentrated block of teaching. This is what my disciples look like, not these traditions. Follow these words of Jesus, and that will mark you as the people of God. And so because the religious leaders have the right words, the right looks, but not the right actions, Jesus gives them this startling implication, this role reversal. Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Now, I want you to think about the people groups that Jesus identifies there. Tax collectors, those who would be viewed as traitors to their country because they worked for Rome. Prostitutes, people who live in a moral lifestyle, so perhaps a liability of judgment. God's going to judge us because we have these wicked people in our land. Jesus says they are going in ahead of you. And I think sometimes I, I read the Bible, and I'm so used to reading these stories, they've become familiar, that maybe the shocking, scandalous elements go over your head. I mean, think about those two groups of people. Think in our context of if a prostitute appeared, sat down on the pews with us, and, and joined with us in worship. It, it might be uncomfortable. It might, okay, is this appropriate? You know, what, what should we be doing here? Jesus says, they're entering the kingdom, and they're entering the kingdom ahead of you. So how important is it to give heed to Jesus' words? Because nothing that we inherit or have or do gives us any head start but rather those who do the will of God. That's what Jesus says here in verse 32. When John showed up, and when he said, all right, this is the way of righteousness. This is what God wants of his people. Repent, turn away from your own ideas, turn away from your own way of doing things, and follow this way of salvation. Follow this person who brings salvation. Those folks did. And why? Why do they not follow the religious leader's message? Was it because it had no power, because it was just tradition, because it was off-putting, because it hindered them? Why didn't they follow? We're not given that answer. But when John came and said, here's the truth, here's the gospel, here's the good news, they said, sign me up. And now they are going in ahead of Israel's religious leaders. So he puts that challenge to them and to us. A gracious invitation to us to see ourselves as as those kinds of folks, that we don't have anything to plead before God. And you hear the challenge, too, not to ever become complacent. Okay, we, we have this favored status, but to always be doing the will of God by grace. And so then we come to the final parable, which illustrates this role reversal, which answers this question, who are the people of God? And it's this parable of the tenants. Let me read it for us, beginning at verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. 
When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Once again, it ties into the language of Isaiah 5, Israel as God's vineyard. And like the previous parable, it, it expresses God's frustration. We'll see some of this next week in Romans chapter 10. That, that his people have failed to obey him. That they haven't borne fruit. They haven't lived up to their identity as the people of God. And once again, a, a parable that, that's very easy in its details. To, it's not hard to understand. The details are pretty clear. God sends messenger after messenger, and they get rejected. And again, we ask, you know, the, the tax collectors and the, and the prostitutes rejected the religious leader's message. But the religious leaders have rejected the prophet's message. Why? Well, we could say love of sin. John makes that point. They love darkness rather than light. Maybe taking security in the things that they were doing. Just maybe their own selfish interests that blinded them to what God was doing. They rejected God's messengers when he called them to Repent. And so finally, this landowner says, well, perhaps they will listen to my son. We, we think of Hebrews 1, that the son is the express image of God. And in these last days, God has spoken to us in his son, but it's the same results. And so Jesus says, what do you think the tenant should do? To, or, or what should the landowner do to those tenants? And once again, they, they admit their own doom. He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. He'll, he'll rent the vineyard to other tenants. Well, how does the phrase go? Truer words were never spoken, Jesus says. Before, though, he declares what those consequences will be, he gives them this last warning. Listen to the danger of rejecting the sun. The stone the builders reject has become the cornerstone. And this is a citation from Psalm 118, verses 22 to 23, it provides one additional element that's not in the parable. See, the parable ends with the son rejected. And so Jesus adds this element. Yeah, well, that rejected son, he's going to be vindicated. And he himself is going to replace the current leadership. And by the way, Psalm 118 was quoted at the triumphal entry. The speaker in the psalm is the king. He represents Israel after triumphing over his enemies. But as we often see in the Bible's use of story, sometimes the key players change sides. And Jesus is warning them. In the Old Testament scriptures, the king represents Israel. He defends Israel. He defeats Israel's enemies. But now Israel, you're acting like the enemies. And God is going to triumph over you. And he's going to take that kingdom from you, and he's going to give it to the people who bear its fruits. And that's what verse 43 says. This reign of God, this identity as the people of God, this salvation for the people of God, it will be given to the people who bear fruit, who identify with Jesus as Lord, who believe in their hearts that God raised them from the dead. God's going to remake Israel. He's going to do a new thing among his people. And those people will be the true people of God. And again, Israel is the historical circumstance. Don't take this too much as, oh yes, these Jews who are stubborn and now God's wrath and curse is on them. It can come on any people group who don't follow the way of God. It can come on the church if we don't listen to the voice 
of God and follow his ways. This, this is what we'll see coming in, in Romans 11. Don't think because Israel is blinded now, oh, there's no hope for them. There's a remnant now, and God can graft them in again. And then Paul warns the church, so don't you boast, or through your own unbelief, branches can be broken off. You, you can start missing out on these blessings of God's salvation history. It's not so much the focus on the ethnicity as it is who bears the marks of God's people. And those marks are defined by grace, by faith, and by doing the will of God, producing its fruit. And so Jesus says, all right, the kingdom is going to be taken from you. It will be given to those who produce its fruit. And anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Does that sound familiar? That's the same verse we saw cited in Romans 9, 33, this stone. And how you respond to the stone is how God will respond to you. You fall on him, you're broken on him, you find your identity in him, well, that's good. But you reject that and go your own way, then he falls on you, and that is doom. But unfortunately, we find in the closing verses, 45 and 46, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they knew he was talking about them. And so they looked for a way to arrest him, for they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet, like their dilemma with John the Baptist. Who are the true people of God, those who do his will and bear his fruit? And so I think it's a, it's a clear application for us tonight as the church of God. First, what a, what a privilege to be named as the people of God and to participate in his salvation by grace, through faith, unconditional love, from a God who loves the world and says, I am love. God is love. What a privilege. What a blessing. And then it brings with it this life that, 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 that I think will excite us to live out a life, to have the identity as the people of God. We often think of that as a challenge, but it's also what a privilege to get out of the bed in the morning and say, God has called me to be his witness. And by my life, to bear witness to the one true and living God. To be a community that bears witness to him. Again, to always be reminded, we have to define that by the Bible. We have to define that by the commission that Jesus has given us, not our own ideas. And I would even say we start with, with Jesus' core teaching here. Not because Matthew is more inspired than Romans, but Jesus himself says, I'm the culmination of the law. Through me, you see how the law and the prophets work together. So he's our lens. He helps us to make sense of the word. He gives us a sense of our identity and how we live out our calling as the people of God. And friends, this is, this is applicable and this is comforting. We live in some of the same circumstances that Jesus and Paul lived in. In their days, there is political instability. There was things going on in government and they didn't know how it would turn out. There was the fear of loss. Things were changing all around them. Their nation was changing. Their history was changing. Jesus showed us in this parable. I'm going to change the very identity of the people of God. Things are going to be look very different. And as I read in a book uh, recently, someone made the point, people don't fear change, they fear loss. With change comes loss. And there is, in the Bible, people facing those situations where they fear Loss. And Jesus comes into that situation. And he sends his apostles into that situation. He says, here's how you can live as my witnesses. It's not a story that's just going downhill. Oh, it's about to end. I just hope I can get out of here before it all crashes and burns. Jesus sends his people into a world like that and says, here's how you live as my witnesses. And here's the future that I give you as my people. Here's how you can bear witness to me. And here's how you can advance my program. So let's pray for God to give us all grace to do that. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus the Lord and his words of comfort to us tonight. It, it is the beauty of your word, God. It is the wisdom of your voice that when you speak challenge, it speaks hope. And that when you correct us, we are thrilled to obey because we see that as the good way. So I pray that the voice of the living God will speak to us, that he has spoken to us tonight, and you will continue to speak to us in the coming week. Words of life and love to lead us as your witnesses, as those who will bear fruit as your people. Forgive us of our sins when we get it wrong. 
Thank you for your mercy that you remember that we're but dust and you forgive and restore and are at work among your people. So we beg of that blessing. We don't presume upon it, we beg of it. And we thank you for what you're doing by your word and spirit. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing one last song, hymn 676, day by day. And with each passing moment, 676, stand with me, please. <laughs> shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>